Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the IEA Clean Coal Centre. My name is Benedicta and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, www.iea-coal.org. Residents of member countries and employees of sponsoring organisations can download our reports at no charge after one-off registration. I should just say, please type any questions um, as we go along and uh, they'll be answered at the end of the webinar. The subject for today's webinar is China's Belt and Road Initiative and Coal, presented by Stephanie Metzger. Over to you, Stephanie. All right, thanks, Benedicta, for the introduction. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. Thanks so much for tuning in. And as Benedicta said, today's presentation is on China's Belt and Road Initiative and the role for coal within it. So today we'll be discussing the Belt and Road Initiative, or the BRI, which is a Chinese-led global infrastructure building program. First, we'll be going over the structure of the BRI, including its scope and its approach to project finance. Then we will look at some case studies of BRI partner countries to understand how the program is implemented. Coal has been a major feature of the BRI with countries around the world using Chinese financing, equipment and construction to build new coal plants. Some regions have been more successful than others in completing BRI projects, and this is because the BRI is a flexible, bottom-up initiative that heavily depends on local cooperation. We'll examine case studies of Pakistan, Vietnam, and Southeastern Europe in order to illustrate these points. And before we get started, as Benedicta mentioned, I'd like to point out that there is a question box where you can submit any questions or comments throughout the presentation. I will answer questions at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to submit questions at any time. You don't have to wait until the end, and that will help facilitate a smooth transition into the question and answer period. So before we zoom into specific countries, we need to understand what the Belt and Road Initiative is. The Belt and Road Initiative, or again, the BRI, which is how I will refer to it throughout the presentation, is China's flagship foreign policy. Debuted in 2013 by Chinese President Xi Jinping, the BRI aims to foster economic cooperation between China and countries across the world. The program is based on the idea of reviving the historic Silk Road, which promoted mutual growth and prosperity through trade. To accomplish this goal, China has been supporting global infrastructure development, including in the power sector. Over 130 countries have signed on to the BRI since its inception, with the majority being low and middle income countries. According to the Chinese government, the goals of the BRI is as follows. Improving intergovernmental communication, strengthening the coordination of infrastructure plans, encouraging the development of soft infrastructure, and bolstering people-to-people -people connections. In the webinar today, we'll be focusing the most on the second point here, which is coordinating infrastructure plans, as obviously that is where coal falls into the mix. As you can see from the map on the slide, the general route of the BRI does mimic major historic and modern trade routes. The black line on the map represents the so-called Silk Road Economic Belt, which connects China to the rest of Asia, through the Middle East, and onto Europe. Now, this map is not necessarily a specific list of countries or cities involved, but it does represent the major route that China is trying to trace. Then the blue line is the 21st century maritime Silk Road, which connects China to Southeast Asia, Africa, and again to the Middle East and onto Europe. The Maritime Road also connects to Central and South America, which is not pictured on this map. And we won't really be talking about that region of the world today, as coal is not a huge part of the Belt and Road in that area. So where is China investing? 
Sectors include transportation, such as roads and airports, communications, ports and maritime shipping, and most recently, health infrastructure as the world copes with the COVID-19 crisis. Most important is the energy sector. It has received the largest amount of funding so far. China has invested in all types of energy projects from coal to solar and wind, since it has manufacturing and engineering experience in all of these areas. China has been a key source of funding for coal projects though. The chart on the right displays the investment in five countries from 2000 to 2019. And while the Belt and Road didn't start until 2013, all of these countries are now part of the BRI as well. So we have Indonesia, which has received the most funding at 9.3 billion, Vietnam at 7 billion, Pakistan 5.6 billion, Bangladesh at 2.1 billion, and Turkey at 1.4 billion, and all in US dollars. In capacity terms, from 2014 to 2019, China financed around 68 gigawatts of coal power plants in BRI countries. However, there has also been an increasing interest in renewable energy since the beginning of the BRI. From 2014 to 2019, China invested in 12.6 gigawatts of wind and solar power, and this number has continued to rise in the last few years. So Chinese financing is key to the success of the BRI, so it's really important to understand how their system functions. Chinese financial institutions fall into two main categories, state policy banks and commercial banks. State policy banks are run for the purpose of financing projects that are sanctioned by the Chinese government's policy. The main institutions of this type are the China Development Bank, the Export-Import Bank of China, and the China Export and Credit Insurance Corporation, which is also called Sinoshore. Of these, the China Development Bank is a traditional development finance institution, which means that its mandate focuses on projects that promote domestic or international development. Deme development finance institutions tend to provide finance on a bilateral basis, from the bank to the recipient country or entity. The other two banks, the China Export-Import Bank and Sinoshore, are export credit agencies, which are government-backed, which provide government-backed credit, insurance, guarantees, and loans for the international operations of corporations from their home country. Basically, every country has one or more of these export credit agencies and are active in helping their countries, uh, helping their companies go out and do international projects. All three of these organizations can be considered development finance institutions due to their large portfolios of development projects. These organizations together account for a significant amount of BRI funding. Chinese commercial banks, on the other hand, operate with standard banking practices, making lending decisions based on factors such as return on investment. Notably, many of these banks are, are, are also partly or fully state-owned. The Bank of China, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, and the China Construction Bank are the three largest commercial banks that are heavily involved in BRI lending. The final main Chinese player in BRI finance is the Silk Road Fund. This publicly owned investment fund was created in 2014 for the express purpose of financing BRI projects. The original investment in the fund amounted to $40 million and contributions were provided by the government's China Investment Corporation, the China Development Bank, and the China Export-Import Bank, as well as government foreign reserves. An additional 100 million renminbi, which is around $15 million, was added to the fund in 2017. The Silk Road Fund is more targeted towards multilateral action. It cooperates with international develop in development institutions and domestic and foreign financial institutions in establishing investment funds, investment companies, and other types of investment entities to co-finance projects. Now, if this group of organizations sounds a bit complicated, it's because it is, and that is one thing we will examine in a moment about issues with transparency in the BRI. But first, let's look at some of the unique practices used by Chinese financing organizations 
when it's provided when they provide loans for BRI projects. First, China is willing to lend to countries with low or no credit rating. As of 2018, China had invested in 29 economies rated below investment grade and 14 with no rating at all. This is not always the case at other national or multinational banks, which makes Chinese financing particularly appealing for some developing countries. However, Chinese banks do still have methods of guaranteeing a return on investment. One way to do this is to use resource-backed loans. These loans take two forms. The first option is for the loan repayment to be tied to the revenue from the completed project. For example, a power plant would earn income from sales of electricity. The local partner involved in the project would secure a Chinese loan by guaranteeing a portion of the plant's revenue for repayment. The second type of resource-backed loan is one that links the provision of loans to sales of the host country's natural resources, usually raw materials such as minerals or agricultural products. The use of collateral is another aspect of Chinese lending that differs from other international banks. Chinese banks often require collateral when lending to developing nations, up to around 60% of the value of the loan. Doing so allows them to claim the property or goods held in escrow if countries cannot make payments. Collateral has become an issue during times of crisis, such as recently during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, when many countries have been asking to delay repayment of their loans. However, China is likely to exercise caution about seizing assets it holds in collateral, as it could damage the reputation of the BRI and make recipient countries less willing to accept Chinese projects. It could also raise the suspicions of Western countries about the geopolitical goals of the BRI. The next issue with Chinese finance, as mentioned before, is that it often suffers from a lack of transparency. This can occur because development finance institutions often work with a variety of financial intermediaries, including local banks and other development funds. The Silk Road Fund is a great example of this type that works with many other intermediaries and thus rarely finances projects directly. This setup can make it difficult to track where the money goes. In addition, Chinese banks do not have the same reporting and public disclosure requirements as banks in other countries, such as members of the OECD. Finally, Chinese foreign aid takes a cooperative and mutual benefit focused approach. China's 2014 foreign aid white paper lays this out. Quote, when providing foreign assistance, China adheres to the principles of not imposing any political conditions not interfering in the internal affairs of their recipient countries and fully respecting their right to independently choose their own paths and models of development. The basic principles China upholds in providing foreign assistance are mutual respect, equality, keeping promise, mutual benefits, and win-win." This non-interference policy is very important for the BRI and for coal in particular because it means that each country can choose their own projects. Nothing is imposed from the top down by China. Of course, large infrastructure projects, and especially the use of fossil fuels, have raised concerns about the environmental impacts of the BRI. There are worries that the BRI is promoting an emissions intensive growth model by encouraging the use of fossil energy in developing countries. And while there have been efforts to make the BRI more environmentally conscious, all guidelines are so far, so far voluntary. The Chinese government calls this process greening the BRI, and this includes devising rules for sustainable investing. Green bonds are one idea to help direct financing towards sustainable projects. The Industrial and Commercial Bank of China issued the first BRI green bonds. They were released in April 2019 at the value of 2.2 billion US dollars. In the coal sector, there are concerns about the construction of inefficient plants. Because of China's policy of non-intervention in the domestic politics of other countries, it does not dictate the type of technology that is used in BRI energy projects. Thus, it's up to each local government to decide what standards, if any, it applies when deciding what projects to pursue. 
As a result, 21% of coal plants financed by Chinese development finance institutions from 2013 to 2017 were built using subcritical technology. You can see in the chart on the right that by comparison, Japanese and Korean banks financed mostly supercritical and ultra supercritical plants, which are shown in the yellow and orange, while China had a much larger proportion of subcritical technology shown in blue. The COVID-19 pandemic and economic slowdown has also changed the BRI. Economic troubles in BRI countries have impacted their ability to pay back their loans, and there have also been delays in supply chains and construction. Demand for electricity has also decreased during lockdowns. The IEA reports that countries experienced an average 18 to 25% fall in energy demand, depending on if the lockdown was partial or full. Even as some countries open up through the beginning of 2021, the timeline for a full recovery remains uncertain, and this has led some countries to reconsider their energy investments, including postponing or canceling large coal projects. Finally, the Chinese introduced the concept of the Health Silk Road in response to COVID-19. The goal of this program is to share Chinese expertise and supplies to help other countries cope better with the pandemic. This new initiative highlights the adaptability of the BRI. It is not a predefined program, but rather a concept that can shapeshift to the current goals of the Chinese government and the needs of the partner countries. Now let's take a look at some BRI partner countries as case studies. First is Pakistan, which is a very representative case study of how the BRI functions and how coal plays into it. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is the current name of China's and Pakistan's cooperation program. The partnership was officially created in 2015, and the plan includes an emphasis on power projects. It is estimated to be worth at least $62 billion. China is the main partner for Pakistan's power sector development. As the BRI is supposed to promote mutual gains, this partnership helps both China and Pakistan with their national goals. The Chinese government wants a land route to the Indian Ocean to improve their access to maritime shipping. Instead of going through the South China Sea, which is currently a sensitive geopolitical issue, China can ship goods through its Western Xinjiang province to Pakistan and straight to the Indian Ocean. On the other hand, Pakistan, which suffers from widespread power outages, wants to develop its power sector and especially coal. The, the Thar lignite reserves located in the Southeast of Pakistan is over 9,000 square kilometers large and has 175 billion tons of coal. Most of the upcoming coal power plant additions will be in this region. 2.6 gigawatts of new capacity fueled by the tar lignite should come online from 2021 to 2023. And you can see on the map in, on the right of the slide that most of the projects are, uh, are clustered in this southeastern region of the country. However, there is also an increasing interest in renewables in Pakistan, and you can see this on the map as well. At the December 2020 UN Climate Ambitions Summit, Pakistan's Prime Minister stated that the country would begin to transition away from coal power and source 60% of its energy from renewables by 2030. Pakistan only had one coal plant before 2016, but there are now at least 10 in the country. And while this announcement will not impact any of these recently built coal plants, he did confirm that two Chinese affiliated imported coal projects would be canceled. These cancellations were also in line with an earlier announcement that Pakistan would not build any plants that would rely on imported coal. However, it's also possible that some of these Chinese coal projects have been shelved because of overcapacity concerns. The government is currently responsible for 850 billion Pakistani rupees in annual capacity payments, which has been a large burden on the debt-strapped electricity system. These issues illustrate how the BRI presents both opportunities and challenges for partner countries. For coal, Pakistan illustrates the challenge of the energy trilemma as it tries to balance security and reliability, 
with new environmental concerns. And again, you can see on the map that most of the coal projects are concentrated in the south and southeast of the country, where the coal fields, the coal reserves are located. But there are also some renewable energy projects, including a few wind farm projects in the southeast and a solar project in the middle of the country and some hydropower in the north. And this map really illustrates how China is involved in all types of energy projects in the country. Vietnam is another interesting case study, study for the BRI. The Vietnamese government takes a different approach to Pakistan, which relies heavily on Chinese partnerships, as we just discussed. Vietnam and China have a complicated historical relationship that still has an impact on their cooperation. While they share a border, a socialist political ideology, and large trade flows, there has also been growing tension over sovereignty in the South China Sea and the influence of the United States in Southeast Asia. Accordingly, Vietnam has been a cautious partner in the BRI. The government has indicated an interest in Chinese investment, but it has also been less willing to follow the typical loan conditions, namely that Chinese contractors are used on the projects. Instead, Vietnamese government, the Vietnamese government has preferred projects with more diverse stakeholders, including Japan, South Korea, multinational banks, and others, to hedge the influence of any one actor. So while the, B the BRI is present in Vietnam, it's not such a crucial source of investment as it is in some other BRI partner nations. The Vietnamese government views the expansion of its power generation as key to its continued economic growth and vital for energy security. It expects significant energy growth and wants to increase generation capacity rapidly from the current 55 gigawatts to 130 gigawatts in 2030, partly to avoid power shortages, which could begin to occur as soon as this year. Vietnam has been planning to vastly expand its coal capacity to meet demand, but its energy strategy is under review and the new focus is likely to be on using more renewable sources. Currently, Vietnam sources around 38% of its electricity from coal. Its 2020, sorry, 2030 goals include a target of 20% renewable energy, and it also ex intends to expand its imports and use of natural gas. However, Chinese banks have become increasingly important in Vietnam's coal projects, as other countries and international banks have moved away from financing coal. Historically, South Korea and Japan have been key investors in coal power in Vietnam, but both countries' financial institutions have indicated that they may forego future investments in coal, and it is still unclear whether projects in progress will continue or be canceled. In some cases, such as the Nam Din One project, Chinese banks took over the project when Korean banks decided against participating. Still, Vietnam prefers multinational partnerships for its projects in order to balance its geopolitical interests. The three Duyen Hai coal projects, coal plants, are a great example of this approach. And you can see on the map that they are located at the bottom, the south of the country. Duyen Hai One has a Vietnamese owner, employed Chinese contractors, and was funded by Chinese and European banks. Duyen Hai Two is owned by a Malaysian company has Chinese contractors, and is funded by Chinese banks. Duyen Hai 3 has a Vietnamese owner, Chinese contractors, and Vietnamese and Chinese financiers. There also was a recent expansion project at Duyen Hai 3, and construction of a third unit was funded by the Japanese Bank for International Cooperation and a consortium of other banks, with Sumitomo Corporation as the contractor, and Toshiba Corporation providing the turbines for the new unit. So again, this project really illustrates how Vietnam prefers to have multinational coalitions involved in all of its projects. Southeastern Europe and the Western Balkans in particular is also an important region for the BRI as it represents a gateway into the rest of Europe and an opportunity for China to grow its influence in the West. While some of these nations are members of the EU and others are not, the group is united in that they all used to be part of the Eastern Bloc under the influence of the Soviet Union. As a result, many of these countries have a significant amount of legacy infrastructure from the Soviet era 
and are dealing with the problems of underinvestment in an ailing infrastructure system. This is especially true in the energy sector. Many countries in southeastern Europe still rely on coal for a significant portion of their electricity production. In particular, Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina both use coal for over 70% of their electricity generation and have many aging coal plants that were built in the Soviet era. Balkan countries are interested in the BRI because China provides no strings attached finance without political interference. Conversely, money from the EU is often difficult to access or comes with too many conditions. This impression is especially the case in the energy sector as European lenders such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and the European Investment Bank have stopped funding new coal projects. For countries such as Bosnia and Serbia, which consider coal as key for protecting their energy security, China has become the best new partner for such projects. However, new coal plant construction in Bosnia and Serbia has caused some conflict with the EU. State guarantees for Chinese loans may violate EU state aid rules, and new plants may not live up to the EU's environmental standards. Both of these issues could imperil these countries' applications to become EU members. One example of this is the main Serbian coal plant project through the BRI, which is upgrades and a new unit at the Kostelak B plant. Chinese funding through the BRI has enabled these upgrades and the new construction, but the upgrades to the plant were still not enough for it to meet the EU's emission standards, in particular for sulfur dioxide levels. This has caused conflict with neighboring EU states, which have complained about high levels of cross-border air pollution. So now that we know how the BRI works and have examined a few countries to see how it functions in reality, we can focus on the main takeaways for coal. While many BRI countries want to expand their power systems, not everyone chooses coal. So what factors influence a BRI country's decision to engage China in building coal power plants? First, countries with domestic coal resources may want to develop coal power as a way to stimulate their mining industries, secure reliable fuel supplies, and reduce energy imports. Both Pakistan and the Southeastern European countries illustrate this point. Second, countries with high power demand growth may want to build out coal power as a large baseload power source. As we discussed, both Pakistan and Vietnam are taking this approach. But even if countries want to build out coal, it doesn't always happen as planned. So what factors influence the outcome of BRI coal projects? What causes delays or cancellations to projects? First, many BRI countries have high debt burdens and may already be responsible for high capacity payments for idle resources. Avoiding overcapacity and unnecessary debt is a major cause of project delays and cancellations. Pakistan, for example, has experienced this roadblock. Second, some countries are beginning to shift their energy strategies away from coal in response to international climate agreements and local environmental activism. Reviews of national energy strategies and the coal pipeline are causing an unclear future for some BRI coal projects. Vietnam has been undertaking such a review and the government has downgraded the importance of coal in its long-term energy strategy. Overall, it is difficult to make sweeping assumptions or predictions about the possible future direction of the BRI because the BRI is a bottom-up initiative. Ultimately, any discussion of the BRI and the role for coal needs to be centered in the context of each partner country rather than a global perspective. That ends today's presentation on the Belt and Road Initiative and coal. My report on the topic will be coming out shortly as well so please watch out for that. If you aren't already signed up to our weekly newsletter, you can sign up on our website and you'll be alerted when the report is released. Thank you so much for watching and I'm now happy to answer any questions.
Okay, we got a couple questions coming in. Uh, first question is, will it be possible to view the presentation? Uh, yes, it will be the presentation. Uh, the slides will be uploaded to our web uh, our website and the recording of the presentation will also be on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can watch out for that after the, uh, very shortly it'll be uploaded after the presentation is over. Okay, let's see. Next question. The BRI is increasing China's influence. Is the result heavy indebtedness to recipient countries? So yes, there's definitely concerns about um, the indebtedness of countries that are partners in the BRI. Um, there are a lot of countries that are already have very high debt burdens that are uh, rated again with their credit ratings and by other you know international organizations are rated to be uh, very close to um, a debt crisis. Um, many developing countries that rely on international aid are for for these types of projects are becoming more wary and they're definitely becoming more wary of the potential to get um, too indebted to China because again of some of these um, conditions that China often puts on its loans for example having to give collateral um, or having to have access to natural resources the famous example of this is the port in Sri Lanka which China helped to build and then when the Sri Lankan government had difficulty paying back the loans China seized ownership of the port and that really sparked a lot of concern uh, in a lot of countries both countries that are part of the BRI, but also other countries that are concerned about China's influence um, in terms of, you know, is it the sort of potential for predatory, potential predatory nature of the BRI. But I think it, on the other hand, there is definitely um, a sort of reticence on China's part to do more actions like that seizure of the port in Sri Lanka because they don't want people to um, think that they are being very aggressive or that the BRI has sinister motivations. So there's definitely a balancing act, both on China's part and on the part of the recipient countries of knowing how much debt they can get into. And I think um, countries are definitely making sure to evaluate that very well before they get too far into their partnerships uh, if there is potential for uh, too much of a debt burden. Let's see. So another question are, what are they doing to comply to net zero carbon emissions? Uh, is our CCS technologies integration integrated into the plants? So, so far, it's a great question. So far, there have been no plants that have been built with CCS already integrated, but there have been some plants that China has been building that are considered CCS ready. For example, the uh, Hasian um, power plant in Dubai, which is billed as to be car as carbon capture ready, but it doesn't have the equipment on from the beginning. Um, it's interesting that you know China has also recently come out saying that they will reach net zero by 2060. But again, as I mentioned, um, their domestic standards and their standards for the BRI don't really match up uh, because China does not. China sticks to the principle of not imposing these sort of political conditions onto their loans or onto their projects. And so while they do have such standards increasingly for their own domestic projects, um, it's up to each partner country how they want to go about achieving net zero or how they want to go about addressing climate goals. And China is not going to force any sort of conditions onto them. So when people ask about um, you know, what to do to make the BRI more environmentally friendly, one thing to do is actually to go to the partner countries and work with the partner countries to improve their plans. And that will trickle back to the types of partnerships that they're asking, uh, the type of partnerships that they're working with China, the type of, of projects that they're looking to uh, to build in partnership with China. So again, another uh, question here, do I understand you right that China sets no governments, governance legitimacy nor environmental standards for its developmental loans? Um, again, 
as, as far as I know, there are not usually these types of standards uh, because the Chinese government views its job to be a partner and that the partner, the host country will be the one who puts those sort of standards on their projects. So if the host country has domestic uh, governance standards, domestic environmental standards, the projects uh, will have to comply with those. Uh, but if not, China is unlikely at the moment to impose such standards themselves. Um, again, that goes back to that sort of approach of mutual benefit, mutual cooperation, and non-interference in local politics. Um, now, there have been a lot of uh, standards suggested for their developmental loans. Um, there are organizations both externally and within the Chinese government itself that are working on guidelines for their uh, for their banks to follow um, green guidelines or environmental guidelines. Um, but usually these are voluntary, so they're suggested that they follow these sorts of guidelines, but it's not at the moment required at all. So it's really up to the bank. Uh, okay, next question. Okay, so one question is how do Chinese investors make decisions on how to select projects? Again, I think this is mostly up to the um, host country, uh, which works with Chinese partners in the um, foreign ministry and the Ministry of Commerce uh, to devise what type of projects they're looking for. And then the international, uh, sorry, the Chinese finance institutions, so the Inter Industrial and Commercial Bank or the China Development Bank or whatever Chinese bank will get in then on that project and decide whether they want to invest. Uh, but again, the, re the the requirements for making an investment decision vary depend on depending on the banks. So the Chinese uh, state policy banks tend to make investment decisions based on Chinese government policy whereas the commercial banks make decisions based on a bit more of a traditional banking method, looking at the return on investment, you know, looking at, at the, the more pure economic costs of the project. Um, so certainly some projects don't get funded um, or they don't have an offer from the banks. Uh, some do have offers from consortiums of Chinese banks, um, but some projects that perhaps are strategically in China's interest, whether that is because China has an interest in exporting that type of technology, or they have an interest in partnering with that country, um, even if projects aren't necessarily completely commercially viable from a traditional banking perspective, it's possible that the Chinese policy banks, the state banks, can step in then to fill that funding gap. Um, but I think it depends on the project and on the bank and again, that's the tough thing with with Chinese teasing out all this these issues with Chinese financing is that there's a, quite a lack of transparency in this process. It's not always easy to tell when a decision is going to be made, or often you don't know that the process is happening of trying to make a decision until the decision is is already done. Um, there's not a lot of room for for input, um, and that's something that makes it really difficult to track what's going on in the BRI because the Chinese finance institutions are sort of such a closed book. Okay, let's see. A uh, question about China supporting the use of lignite as a hydrogen source in perhaps Japan and Australia uh, or Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, I haven't seen anything about using lignite as a source for hydrogen production but I do recommend you check out uh, our website. We have a few reports either just recently published and also in progress going into um, the production of hydrogen and the way coal might be used in that. So I definitely recommend checking out some of my colleagues' reports on that subject because it's definitely a very interesting topic. Uh, let's see. Okay, another question about CCS. Um, so CCS in coal projects, both retrofits and new build, 
would require access to CO2 storage? Is there any sign of interest in CCS and BRI projects? And do target countries have access to CO2 storage? So I would say, yes, there is, again, some interest in that some of the coal plants that China is building are considered to be CCS ready. So despite the fact that China is building some lower technology, subcritical technology plants, there are also quite a few plants that are being built to a very, very high standard. Um, they're very efficient using ultra supercritical technology and are considered carbon capture ready, meaning that in theory, it would be easier to retrofit uh, the technology in the future. But I haven't seen anything about CO2 storage in relation to the BRI. Uh, certainly, some countries may have access to CO2 storage, um, depending on where they are. And there's growing interest in sort of regional storage hubs for uh, carbon in places like Asia, uh, China itself, in Europe, uh, having regional carbon capture, transport and storage infrastructure, um, for example. So it's possible that some countries will have access to CO2 storage in the future, but not necessarily through the BRI. Um, again, that's that's quite an interesting question. And I recommend you as well look to uh, some of our past reports on carbon capture and storage, as well as um, upcoming reports that will be in progress by both by my other colleagues and myself on the topic as well. Um, because yeah, this is a very important question for coal. Let's see. Another question. Uh, most of the coal plants are based on old technology. Are they putting, what backend equipment are they putting in place? Flue gas desulfurization, et cetera. Um, so not all the coal plants are based on old technology. Again, some are quite high tech and some are, are not quite so high tech. Um, but again, what technology they're using in terms of um, pollutant control depends on the country as well and, and the specifics of what the country wants and what the plans for the plants require. Um, so for example, the plants that I mentioned in Serbia have um, all types of pollution control. However, whatever uh, upgrades they've done, so the, the Serbian plant, the Kostelak B plant, specifically underwent a retrofit for flue gas desulfurization. Um, but for whatever reason, because of the perhaps um, lower technology of the plant or the lignite used in the fuel, um, I'm not sure exactly, but for whatever reason, they, it still has not met the, uh, the EU's uh, desulfurization standards. So again, it, 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 it sort of depends country to country and what their standards are. That sort of thing wouldn't be okay in the EU, but, but Serbia is, is fine with it. Um, but again, there are certainly a lot of plants that are being built that are using sub, uh, supercritical technology and ultra supercritical technology as well, and that have the full range of pollution control equipment, um, such as a few plants in Turkey, in the UAE, uh, Dubai, in um, one of the new plants in Pakistan, same thing, uh, or sorry, in Bangladesh, are all built um, to a very high standard as compared to some of the the older units. So uh, that also sort of goes into another question, which is how much is new build and how much is upgrading? There's certainly a lot of new build projects, um, but a lot of them also come with upgrades um, or potentially replacements, um, like the one in Serbia, which is a upgrade to the existing system as well as building a new plant. Um, but I think uh, basically uh, in the report, all of the plants that are discussed for the most part, are new builds. Um, again, a lot of the countries that are partners in the BRI are developing countries that have very rapidly um, growing energy demand, and so they really need to expand their power generation, not just refurbish old plants, although that there is a part of that as well in many cases. Let's see here. One question is, um, is China exempt to the Paris Agreement or are they moving into renewable energy? So the China is not exempt to the Paris Agreement, but again, the Paris Agreement targets, uh, each country determines their own 
national contributions to the Paris Agreement. And so China has its own national contributions uh, that it's working on domestically, but uh, other countries may have different agreements and many uh, countries did actually build coal into their nationally determined contributions. They they planned to have some room for coal power. And so China is certainly ha happy to help them with those projects uh, that they have already planned for. But China actually is moving into re the renewable energy space a lot as well. Um, China is a huge manufacturer of parts, for example, solar panels and wind turbines. And China has been increasingly working with countries I guess I should say countries have been increasingly demanding renewable energy as well. And so China is happy to work on them, uh, renewable energy projects with them because it has engineering and construction and uh, manufacturing expertise in this area. And so its companies can definitely work on those projects. So we've seen a rise in interest in renewables um, across the world really, but especially in Africa. China has been working on a lot of solar projects in Africa. Obviously, many countries in Africa have very high solar potential. Uh, and China also has been involved in many hydropower projects um, in all regions of the world, in Southeast Asia, in Africa, uh, as well as South America. So definitely China is big in the renewable space as well. But again, they take sort of a technology agnostic view where they are happy to work with the country on the projects they want. So if the, if the host country wants a renewables project, they will do that. If a host country wants a coal project or a gas project, they are also able to work on that. Um, so it sort of depends on what the countries uh, in question want. Uh, okay, I think most of the other questions are sort of repeats of ones I've already um, addressed, but if um, if anyone has other countries, or sorry, other questions that I didn't answer, or if you feel like I didn't answer your question uh, that you submitted here, please feel free to email me. My email is, is below at the bottom of this slide, uh, and I would be happy to answer any more questions or discuss anything here further. Um, it's certainly a very interesting topic, and um, there will be more to come, I'm sure, on this topic in the future. So thank you all so much for uh, for attending the webinar today. I really appreciate it. And again, let me know if you have any other questions. Super. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and thank you for all the questions. It's it's really great when, uh, when there's a lot of interest. <laughs> it is a great topic. Um, and as Stephanie said, the slides from this webinar will be available to download from our webinar page shortly. And also you can watch the recording on our YouTube channel. And all that's left for me to say is the next webinar from us will be um, Wednesday the 16th of June at the same time. Stay tuned for more details. Thank you all for joining us today and goodbye.